head of female uh, women's department in LTA. Yep. And uh, well-known speaker around the world. Um, he's also known as Mr. Stats. He loves statistics. He used to do. So, um, and um, how I know him, which is a little bit more interesting. Um, he's always late. Uh, not a little bit late, a lot late. Uh, he can't keep track of time. We will see that when he holds his presentation here. Um, and he's a, you know, That's a good... That's why you installed the clock. He's, he's, <laughs> He's, he's very influence, uh, in, uh, influenced by Norway because three of his children has Norwegian name. Lars, Finn and Stig. Stig. Absolutely. But foremost, I know him as a good tennis friend and always great to hang around. And you will most see that tomorrow when we have a party at Kult, 9, 7.30. <laughs> so... Um, have a chat with him, and, uh, but not for too long. <laughs> Pass cool. him around. Here you are. An applaud for Carl. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you can hear by my voice, I am not excited. Okay, everybody started here full of energy, being very excited to be in Norway. Uh, I'm not excited for two reasons. They've put me after Emma Doyle, okay? <laughs> Impossible to match that, okay? Uh, the question was, where does she get her energy from? I think it's called Duracell or something like that, I think. <laughs> The human Duracell battery, uh, but it's always great to uh, am I seeing you. Uh, uh, the second reason uh, why I'm a little bit subdued is because uh, Aslak uh, contacted me a few weeks ago and he says, talk a little bit about yourself, your coach path and stuff like that. And, you know, as some of you uh, might remember when I've been here before, I always try to give you a number of tools that can make you a better player, whether it's uh, technical, tactical, about female tennis, integration, integration of fitness into, onto the tennis court, uh, things that I'm very comfortable with. Uh, those tools you're not going to get today. You are not going to be a smarter tennis coach today, okay? If you need to know anything about tennis, find it on Google, okay? Uh, also, like mentioned today already, the hard skills versus the soft skills. And what I've come to discover throughout my career, and that's actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk you through my life a little bit, which is uncomfortable because that's definitely something that I've never done before, okay? Uh, uh, mostly they do that uh, when people are dead or when they've achieved something or whatever. But um, uh, it was an interesting exercise anyway to come uh, onto a few pivotal moments and the only tool that you're going to need this afternoon is a mirror and look at yourself and I would like you to go home and actually have a few reflective moments of where you say hmm okay here I was at a crossroad and here I've made such and such decision because of a person because of a situation uh, because of a movie that you see a book that you've read uh, there's various things and people that can influence your career, okay? And I would like to share a few of those things uh, with you, both professionally and personally. Life didn't start great, okay? My father went to the registry office and he spelled my name wrong, okay? So, not a, not a great start, okay? They did, however, uh, allow me to pick up a sport because that's what parents do. They make choices for their children and at the age of, I don't know, two, three, I was holding up a racket somewhere on a, on a holiday. Kept playing, you know, and tennis became my, my passion and part of my life. Uh, it was something that, you know, even in, you know, my bedroom, you see Bjorn Borg there, although I've never had a double-handed backhand, you know, I did have his uh, his racket and so on. And I became only a half-decent tennis player and I was smart enough to know my limitations um, that I probably wasn't going to be a tennis player, okay? 
Um, but there was one thing that I have to thank my parents for, uh, is to spell my name with a C, and to let me allow to live my passion. And if there's something, who, do we have parents here? Hands up, those who have children. Um, I think it's about 50% of the people here that have parents. But even those without uh, uh, children, our life is about impacting people as a parent or as an educator. And we often don't realize enough how powerful the tool is of communicating with people. What we say and how we say it are two different things, but we can influence these people much more than we ever realize. I'm lucky enough to have four healthy children. They're all involved in sport. They're also telling me something. They tell me what they like, they tell me what they don't like. Okay, and I would like to have it a, a little bit about this little fellow here. Uh, and uh, he's probably the fastest runner in Belgium. You know, when he was nine, you know, he ran one kilometer in three minutes and 40 seconds. That's about uh, uh, 16 and a half kilometers per hour. Okay, that's crazy. Okay, he's a talented runner. Okay, now he stopped doing that. He didn't like it. You know, sometimes kids tell you what they like. He told me that, you know, he didn't like that anymore. You know, he didn't like the elbowing, he didn't like the competitive spirit. So, this is what he does like. This is how he falls asleep every evening. With a bunch of fluffy animals around him, and I've got about 50 of them at home. Not fluffy animals. The real deal that needs to be fed in the morning at 6.30. And this guy does that. You know, before school, He's been feeding around, well, it changes every day, between 40 and 50, we live in a forest, so sometimes animals disappear. But, you know, he feeds around 40 or 50 animals, you know, every morning. And I think that is crucial to understand that what our children want. We've lost Kurt Douglas a few days ago, or it might have even been yesterday, and on the Academy uh, Twitter account, uh, uh, he posted, or they posted, that when he was a child, he was acting and the mother made an apron, uh, he played a shoemaker, and then he got his first Oscar. He got an ice cream from uh, his father. I think as educators, as a coach, we have a mission, okay? The hourly high rate does not come into play when we work with children, and of course, we do things for a certain reason. Um, and I'll come back to that later. Um, I was not good enough as a tennis player. I played a few satellite tournaments, futures, you know, up the national championships and, and so on. But I realized that I had to do something. I wanted to do something with tennis, but it wasn't going to be as a tennis player. I went to university. Uh, I'm apparently a master in sports science and exercise physiology and a few more titles. Uh, but this degree is not really important. You know, when I was at university and we were able to, to join the NCAA uh, Milwaukee Tennis Cl Classic one year, uh, I discovered something else at university. You know, I had a new sensation. I discovered something about myself which I, at the moment, probably didn't realize. It's only in hindsight that I've realized how much this song meant for me. It's not Bill's strip club, okay? I discovered something during one of my classes uh, at university and uh, I had, I had uh, several hobbies besides uh, tennis and one of them was uh, uh, being the, uh, uh, the president of the student club and we went uh, out quite a fair bit so we had great parties but I was also investing in my career and I was going to uh, the federation in Belgium already and I missed a lot of lessons. I missed a lot of lessons. Uh, at university. 
And uh, as part of our curriculum, we had to also give a dance lesson at some point. You know, there was a few weeks where you know, we, we learned a few dance moves, and uh, I missed all the preparation, and all of a sudden I saw my name on the board, and I had to give a dance lesson in front of my college from you know, 800 students, you know, of course divided in small groups, but I had to give a dance lesson. My dance partner is arriving, by the way. Emma, tomorrow we dance, you just missed the song. Wait, I'll play it again. Get ready, so you get in the rhythm for tomorrow. Emma. Yeah. Um, and I had to do a song, and I had to sort of improvise the night before what I was gonna do during that lesson. And the choreographer, uh, or our teacher, our professor was a choreographer, and uh, so he, uh, uh, we each had to sort of do this stuff for 20 minutes, and after the lesson, he, he told me uh, a triple A for this uh, uh, person. And a triple A is about the highest score you can get. And there was quite a bit of controversy uh, about that because I'd never attended his lessons, and he gave me the maximum score. What I discovered there was that I probably had a natural ability uh, uh, to teach to entertain a group of people and to organize this lesson, even if I hadn't been really uh, prepared for that. And uh, uh, he became a good friend, uh, a great mentor, and uh, he was one of the people that said, listen, you're, this, this five years that you spend at university, uh, you are not meant to sort of go for a degree. You know, you've got other talents that you need to uh, materialize. And uh, he was really a person that, uh, that made me realize that I had to invest in other areas. And I, I, I am sure it was not until later how I realized how important this person had been. It was also the time where there was a movie uh, coming, and some of you might have seen Dead Poet Society. Does anybody know the movie? Hands up. Has anybody seen Dead Poet Society? I'm going to just make one, one, one little clip out of it, but I recommend the majority has not seen it try to see it. If we are in a situation where we are, where we work with young people, where we have a group that we want to engage, you know, and where we want to make an impact on, on lives, this is the movie that you have to see. How important is that, Jen? Question one rates the poem to perfection. Question two rates its importance. And once these questions have been answered, determining the poem's greatness becomes a relatively simple if the poem score for perfection is applied on a horizontal graph... Mr. Keating, they made it right. It was you gotta believe me, it's true. I do believe you, Tom. Leave, Mr. Keating. But it wasn't his fault. Oh, down, Miss Candace, and one more time works from you or anybody else, and you're out of this school. Leave, Mr. Keating. I said leave, Mr. Keating. good um, qualities of a great coach today uh, from Bill, from, uh, from Emma and so on. One of the things that didn't appear, I think, on the list, unless I, I missed it, was uh, uh, inspiration. Okay. You as a leader, as a coach, you're inspiring the next uh, generation. Okay. 
Uh, and there's a lot of qualities that are important, but the inspiration is something that I think is a, is a value that's deep down, okay? And when the going gets tough, you know, it's an inspiration, it's a dream that will get you true, okay? I only discovered that much later, uh, that this was, and I still get goosebumps when I look at this clip, uh, and I didn't realize it at the time, although it has affected me, but at that moment in time, I was convinced when I was at university, uh, my how, I knew what I was gonna do, I was gonna make a difference. How I was gonna do it, I was gonna do it by putting the theory into practice, because these big books, and these, they didn't really mean a lot to me unless I could really make them practical. Okay. I started about five dissertations, and I stopped all of them because I didn't believe they had an added value for the end user, for the user experience, we would call it uh, uh, these days. Sometimes we don't know the impact of what we have done on people's life until much later. I knew what I was going to do. I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. I knew how I was going to do it. I was going to read every book, I was going to look at a lot of videos, and I was going to, via a systematic approach, you know, via some great course on Richard Smith, you know, from Motor Learning, very interesting book to read if you have a chance, and I then started to make the system, the lesson plans, the system, everything was in place. You know, I can tell you today probably what I did in 1989 uh, with uh, certain players that I started coaching in my first weeks when I, when I started as a coach. But it was not until much later that you realize what actually is important to people. And uh, Ivan uh, was there, uh, 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 in 2012, I think, in Belgium, when Kim organized her thank you games. You know, she was stopping her career, she organized a match uh, against Venus Williams, and uh, had the sport palace in, in Antwerp filled with 15,000 people, and she played the match, and then afterwards, you know, it was a big party, it was very late, I remember, uh, or even as well. Uh, but, uh, Kim took a microphone in front of 50,000 people and, and went over her career and started thanking people. And we're all a little bit vain and we want to know what people maybe think of us. Uh, we all have that sort of bit of pride. And I was very curious what she was going to say, actually. You know, she says she's going to thank me too, that she can do the split, you know, that she's won uh, 40 tournaments, that she's done this, that she's done that. And uh, so I was a little bit curious and uh, she comes up, uh, she was, I think, 29, she was, uh, how old was she then? Uh, in 2012, she was, uh, she's 37 now, how old was she, how old was she then? 30 something, yeah? Uh, almost 30, 29. And uh, she said, thank you, Carl, for being there uh, when my mother was sick. Her mother had a liver transplant, and for a few months, she was, uh, she was, Terminal, declared terminal, and she wasn't going to survive, she wasn't going to make Christmas. And we were, uh, uh, soon after the diagnosis, we went abroad, we went to Israel to play, uh, to play a $25,000 tournament. She could play those already, that's how good she was at, that, at a very young age. And, uh, and I didn't realize uh, what an impact, what my role had been on her life. It was much more, it was much more than talking about a forehand or a backhand. And I didn't discover that until you know, many years later. So what we have to realize, when we communicate, communication is a two-way process. You, know, you send a message out with a certain purpose, but it doesn't always, uh, or it will not always be received in the way that you want it to be received. And we need to be aware of that. And these days, and these are the soft skills, the relational skills that Aslak was talking about, if you learn how to develop those, you will be a better coach, okay? And it is important what we have in our toolbox. The toolbox from, uh, uh, from Emma, is, it's important, you know? The toolbox I had on my first uh, uh, slide there. You know, the more you know, the more you will be able to do the right thing at the right time. If you make the right decision, and you can only make the right decision if you know your clients and if you know who they are and why they are in the sport or why they are um, doing that. So uh, when Kim thanked me, uh, this was a very uh, 
surreal moment for me. And uh, it's probably the reason why a few years ago, when she was inducted into the Hall of Fame, she also asked me to do her induction speech, which is, for me, a much bigger recognition than probably the number of trophies that we have won uh, together. Um, this is a nice uh, story as well, okay? Makes us realize how important our clients, our players are, and also the parents. This is Andre Agassi, also in the Hall of Fame, talking about uh, his father. And uh, who's read the book from Andre Agassi? Open. A few people have read it. <laughs> it's not always a nice book if you're, if you're his father. You know, there's a few paragraphs that you think like, hmm, I hope my children don't like that about me. Okay, but here's Andre Agassi. You know, not long ago, I was uh, giving a talk in my hometown in Las Vegas, and after I spoke, there was this uh, answer and question period. First hand up, first questions out of the box, was a man in the front row. You could see in this man's face that he was really struggling with something. He took the microphone, stood up, and asked, how do you know when to stop telling your kids what to do? The questioner was my father. I was caught off guard that night. I didn't know what to say. I, I don't remember what I did say. But the answers come to me now so, so clearly. Dad, when I was five, you told me to remember it. When I was seven, you told me when all the four grand slams. And more times than I can remember, you told me to get into the Hall of Fame. And when I was 29, I don't know if you remember this, you told me to marry Steffi Graff. <laughs> Best order you ever gave me. So Dad, please don't ever stop telling me what to do. Uh. Very nice to see somebody talk about the parents and see how they go through life and actually have a different relationship with different people. And we will have different relationship with our clients as well, okay? And when you're a young coach, you will also be different than when you're a little bit older, you know? Uh, I'm turning 50 this year. I can't beat Ivan in uh, being, what, 40 years on the court. Um, but it is important to understand that we go through an evolution and we change and also our clients change. But uh, look at this, these are your clients. These are the people that we have to understand. Okay, this is a mother watching her nine-year-old kid. And we have to understand, we have to understand why this woman is like this. Now, tennis has changed. Tennis has become an early development sport and a late maturation sport, okay? Too many parents have this carrot dangling in front of their kid and thinking that they're ever gonna mean something in the tennis world. Well, they're most likely not, okay? Uh, who was it who said, do you wanna be a CEO or do you wanna be a top tennis player? Well, I'll tell you, Mike? Mike, yeah, but, well, let me tell you, it's much easier to be a CEO of a multi-million dollar uh, company than to become a successful tennis player and make your millions in tennis. It's not going to happen, but the perception lives that that is possible, so the investment in time, in effort, and also in money of parents is great, and we have to appreciate that, okay? The coaches that say, oh, you know, I wish the parents weren't there, you know, it's much easier if they were... You know, if they, if they never came and watched. No, we need to have the parents included in this triangle of development of the kid. Okay, nobody knows the children better than the parents. And here's a smart trick to do that. Include them in your story. Okay, use them as an assistant coach in certain very objective. They don't need to teach the kid how to tennis, but include them in the story because they will feel appreciated and you might actually get more out of them than you had thought initially. 
It's all about finding the right balance, going back to Andrew Agassi. The balance is important for our lives, the balance is important for the people uh, that we work with. Andrew Agassi, without his dad, would have never been the player he is now. Steffi Graf would have never been the player that she is today. I put this in last minute because yesterday Ivan gave me a book and it was in Norwegian, so I didn't understand too much, but I did see a balancing act in terms of giving feedback to the player. And I think everything in life is about the right balance. Okay? And it's about how much we can cope with. And Agassi and Graf could clearly cope with a lot. Okay? That's why they used the pressure that they got, actually they could cope with it, and it made them the people that they were. But we have to make sure that that balance is always there. Uh, parents are having a motivation, uh, and they choose why children do a certain sport. But there's different gradations of motivations. Why do you choose tennis? Why do they not go and play other sports? We talked about that, the rivalry that, that exists in other sports. We need to motivate children to keep playing tennis. Okay? That's our future. And it starts with engaging the little ones. That's why Mike Barrell's part is so important to have this nice first experience. Why do we continue to play tennis? Why do we persist playing tennis? And how intense do you want to do? Do you want to become a high performance player or do you just play for fun? Motivation is very, very complex and it's a combination of a lot of factors. And we as coaches are one of those factors. Okay? We as coaches are one of that, those factors. And probably 20 years ago, we would, it would be by telling a lot what they had to do. Now we've heard from Federer and so on that listening is also a very important aspect. Let's have a look. I, I mentioned earlier when I was at university that I always like to make things uh, with a theoretical background, I try to put them into practice. It's my backbone, it's something that I can rely on. And this is a very old study from an American psychologist, Maslow, who made this pyramid of needs. Uh, it's quite contested over the years, but for me, I like the reference. You know, and if you look and make up for yourself when you hold up the mirror, where you are in this pyramid. You know, obviously our first primary need is to have money, okay? It doesn't need to be very high salary, but if we coach, it's our work, we need to have a roof above our head, we need to have shelter and we need to have food, that's all. Then we go into safety needs, social needs, esteem needs, and self-actualization needs. And as we get older, I experience myself, you start doing things for different reasons, you know? I don't have the feeling that I've ever worked for money. I actually have a feeling that I've ever worked with. Um, you have to make up your mind why you want to do this job. Okay? Um, and a lot has got to do with extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. And when you do something with an intrinsic motivation, you do something because you enjoy it for the activity that you're doing. In this case, two boys playing football. Enjoying the game, enjoying teaching, enjoying seeing progress in children. Okay? You give them a challenge, you know, and you see that in, after 30 minutes they can master that challenge, whether it's juggling, whether it's tennis, whether it's playing a violin. That enjoyment we need to have as coaches as well in our job. And otherwise, well, first of all, I don't think you would be here, okay? But otherwise, you probably need to look out for something else. There's this very smart grandfather that used to live in a house alone, and children went to uh, kick a football against his wall, and made a lot of noise, and uh, uh, it was uh, us like who was kicking the ball uh, uh, against Oven's house. Huh? To be, we like metaphors and such. <laughs> I was like, he's kicking a football against the wall of Oven. Uh, and uh, Oven is very smart. He's still smarter than Aslak. Okay, so he comes out and he says, uh, uh, well, Aslak, uh, uh, here's uh, 20 euros, okay, for uh, doing this, this activity. And I said, hmm, <laughs> that's pretty cool. 20 euros, we can uh, have an extra drink and cult tomorrow. 
And the next day, of course, Aslak comes and uh, uh, starts doing the same thing, takes his foot wall, kicks against uh, Oven's wall, and Oven uh, comes out and says, I was like, I don't have any 20 euros notes anymore. Uh, but here's 10 euros. Aslak said, okay, okay. 10 euros, that's right, he goes away, and the next day, of course, he comes back, and Oven comes out, and uh, he doesn't have 10 euro notes anymore. He's only got 5 euros. And Aslak goes like, do you really think that for five euros I'm gonna kick a football against your wall? So it's a uh, uh, it's an example that money can work demotivating. You should never work for money. You know, you will survive without money because you will find you need to chase your passion, and within your passion you will overcome difficult hurdles, and that might mean not having a great deal of money at some point. But you will overcome if you find a way to do your passion. If you're going to do this only for the money, and that's a good reason for it, and people can be motivated by having a lot of money on the bank. But uh, Ivan, we had a nice story about uh, uh, a person that Ivan knows very well. You know, at one point, it stops for all of us. And I think if we then look back, I don't think money is the biggest motivator in our life. It's a satisfier, but it's not a motivator, or it should not be a motivator. But people will make choices for money, for other things, especially in today's society. I like some metaphors, as like always says, so I've put in a metaphor. Uh, we used to have this phone, everybody in Belgium had this phone, okay? The National uh, uh, Telecommunication Company had only one mobile phone. Okay. And then you had to give this phone back, okay, and then you received another one, the one with the buttons, you know, and then you called, yeah, have you got it already, have you got it already, no, not yet, no, next week they're coming. It was the system who was deciding how we were communicating with each other, okay. Today you go with your 12 year old to some media mart or some other electronic shop and they can choose between 37 different smartphones uh, to communicate with each other. It's got a huge influence on today's society, okay? Millennials, those who become adults since 2000, so they will now be between 19 and uh, uh, 38, something like that. The career span for those people who are working is four years. People move around, okay? And it's normal that you will make choices and maybe not do this for the rest of your life. Right? If, especially if you're a young coach, the average career span is four years. And we need to take that into account when we make choices. And I will give you a few examples of my sort of two careers that I've had, one as a coach, and one more as a manager or director. I have named this Hello Peter. Does anybody know the Peter Principle? No? The Peter Principle is the fact that everybody will continue to climb up within your organization, within the hierarchy, until you reach the level where you are not capable anymore. And that's where you see this. It's a very traditional model in the organization structure, much more in the past than now, because now you just switch organization. But you used to always, in the past, stay within the same organization and climb up as high as possible. Beware, keep following your dreams and your passion, okay? A job is only something that pays for your mortgage. Okay? You need to do something what you like doing because then you can, then that you can keep doing until the rest of your career. So make sure when you get opportunities, and I've made that choice to come away from coaching full time to do something else in life, and it still makes me wake up. You know, people that know me know that they can probably reach me at six o'clock in the morning or also at one o'clock at night. Okay? So it still drives me. Uh, but once upon a time, 
I was only a coach and I come from university and I had all this toolbox with all this knowledge and I thought I knew everything and I was traveling around with this team and you recognize young Kim, your Oliver Rockers and Xavier Maliz and I was convinced, I was convinced that this was because I made all my lesson plans and all this stuff like that and you know we won the European Championships on the 14, I mean every tournament we went to uh, we took home uh, most of the trophies and that was because of me, okay. Now I know a little bit different, but at the time you can see it, my schmuck face, you know, I thought this was uh, all about me. Um, we had a lot of fun, okay? This is also what made me survive in this world, because no job is always fun, okay? And this is a tribute to, unfortunately, somebody who's sick and he's not here today. Uh, unless his Pella is somewhere hiding, but uh, he's been sick, Pella Fidel. But uh, you recognize Pella here. This is Pella Fidel. This is not Benny Anderson, it's Pella Fidel. And uh, for those of you who know me, uh, I normally don't have a beard, but uh, 25 years ago, uh, I met Pella at the Orange Bowl. And a few months ago, when I was here, we decided to have our anniversary party tomorrow at Kult. By the way, you're all invited. Uh, Pella is going to sing. Uh, uh, <laughs> At least if he's better, he will be there. But fun is unbelievably important. And I'm putting up here this AMA story and a small anecdote for that is that uh, when we were, uh, this was not in the Orange Bowl, I think this was in the European Championship in, uh, uh, in Switzerland somewhere, uh, uh, when Pala went off to the toilet. And we, we both had a goatee. So that's why we're growing it for these few days, but it's going off on, uh, on Sunday. So Espen, I hope you have me with the goatee at some point. Cool. Uh, so 25 years, Pella and I had a goatee, and tomorrow we will have it as well. But uh, he went off to the toilet in this bar, uh, and uh, uh, they were just playing an ABBA song, and uh, we were talking to some uh, young female company, and uh, they all like goatees. And uh, so when he went off to the toilet, I said, this is Benny Anderson, and he's just divorced from Frida from ABBA, and so, so he's very sad when they play ABBA. I said, what? And when they came back, these, uh, these female people had a lot of empathy for, uh, uh, for uh, Pella. So Pella had a great night, you know, being Benny, uh, being Benny, being Benny Anderson. Um, okay, um, fun is very important, you know, and when people send me holiday pictures and say, oh, I'm having breakfast on the beach, holiday greetings, uh, I start to moan, you know, I'm not always as upbeat as I, uh, uh, as I am, so when they send me these uh, postcards or photos or, or whatever, I start to moan and I say, Jesus, don't bore me with this thing, I never have a holiday, okay, I never have a holiday, but there's a side note to it, I also never worked. Okay, so if you never work, you never need a holiday, of course, and this is a, this is, a principle that I think uh, we need to f you need to find a way in your job that your job is not a burden okay people will feel that okay and I'm gonna give one uh, one compliment for myself because I didn't like this presentation at all Alpha, okay uh, but uh, I give myself one compliment and I think the people that I work with and when I'm working with them intensively and not just as a quick high or whatever, or when it's the first day, they will feel the authenticity of what I'm talking about. Okay? And that's what you need to find in your job. Okay? It's not a tick box. You know? and there's, no, there's no single list in my presentation. You know, the list, look them up on Google. Okay? You cannot live by lists. You, know? you need to find a way to have that passion go. Um, I was very lucky to be able to come across Kim Glass when she was young and, and throughout her life and get to the Fed Cup final and have a lot of uh, interesting moments. Life. And then this happened. For the past seven years, I've been a full-time model and I love it. I really, really do. Okay, that gets Oh, we are not about it. Yeah, fuck it. But I also love being a professional tennis player. I miss that feeling. So, what if I try to do both? Are you thinking about a comeback, Kim? Any chance? 
Could I be a loving mom to three kids and the best tennis player I could possibly be? Let's do this. Let's come back one more time. See you in 2020. Yeah, when, when she told me about eight months ago, I was happy that I was sitting on a chair uh, when she announced this, uh, this comeback. But uh, I'm very happy to be part of that. However, in a different setup, you know, uh, both Sam and I have been involved in most of her career are now only supervising this and we're doing this once a week. And uh, it's now much more of performance management. And I think this is a, another crucial evolution in, uh, uh, in high performance tennis. Uh, these days. You know, 20 years ago, I was driving around in my Opel Corsa around Europe with Kim and I was saying what she had to eat, what time she had to go to bed. Uh, I decided most of her life. We don't realize how much time we spend with these, uh, uh, with these children sometimes. Now, there is a lot more expertise around there and this performance management uh, is crucial and that's more my role and the first time I came in that new role and you all have to make up your mind whether you want to do that I mean there is nothing wrong if you coach 40 hours per week and you're doing a good job and your manager in the club or whoever in the organization says ah, maybe you should do a little bit more of the administration and you should do a bit more of the planning there is nothing wrong okay by saying Listen, I am really happy with what I'm doing and I would like to keep coaching for 40 hours. You, know, you don't have to do that. And I think this is an important uh, aspect that I've learned in the business cycle of tennis, how important it is to have the right people in the right place. And how many factors are influencing this business cycle. Okay, from communications to organizing tournaments to organizing events, to have in a big organization an HR department. And at the end of the day, of course, we have to win. But winning within an organization means different things. Okay, winning for a coach is different than winning for the administrator. Okay, winning for the cleaning lady, who's also part of this business cycle. Okay, one of the things that uh, I learned from my time in England was that when the cleaning lady was asked what she had to do, you know, she felt part of the team and she helped to develop tennis players. Because when the toilets are clean, the coaches and the players don't mind using the facilities, the, the locker rooms, the toilets, and they're all part of the team. And that's what we need to strive for. <coughs> um, some of you might remember this. I've done a presentation for Olympia Toppen a number of years when I was here. And uh, uh, the what and the how, I said that we wouldn't talk about that today. You can look that up in Google. Uh, plenty of stuff to read there. But this why, and it's coming from, uh, from Sinek, who you might have heard of in the, with his golden circle. He says the most important part is the why in the middle. Uh, but whilst, in my opinion, when you need to get to the middle, uh, you first will miss a few things and then ultimately you will get to the middle. So I think it is important to first find out the why before you can have a good uh, decision on what your goal setting is and how you're going to uh, achieve that. And here's a nice little uh, uh, clip. You see that I've used a lot of movies because I think they, couldn't, they can be inspirational. You know, when the going gets tough and you feel like you might not be happy in your job, uh, there might be things happening, you know, dealing with adversity, certain other things that it's not always yourself that will pull you through. So you need to have what some pillars. Your why? why did you get out of the bed this morning? Why did you eat what you ate? Why did you wear what you wore? Why did you come here? We are here to connect. Life is about people. Advertising is about illuminating how our products and services will improve people's lives. Now, how do we do that? Love, time, death. Now these three abstractions connect every single human being on earth. Everything that we covet, everything that we fear not having, everything that we ultimately end up buying is because at the end of the day, we long for love, we wish we had more time, and we fear death. 
love, time, death. Now take away the very abstract uh, three words from Will Smith, but I've watched this movie uh, uh, with some people, and this is a very powerful movie, The Collateral Beauty. You know, I recommend that uh, uh, you go and watch it or you find it on, uh, uh, on some uh, streaming device. Um, it will make you very humble. It will make you realize that what you think is important in life is maybe not that important, okay? And it will help you becoming uh, a better person, a better influencer uh, on your job. So, the what and the how is well documented. We all know that. Okay. I think today I heard a lot about the why. Okay. If the why proceeds to what and the how, things will happen more easily. There's even one thing that is more important. If you need to motivate children, if you need to motivate your team, you need to find out who you are. Okay. And if you know who you are, you can also better understand others and how to motivate them. Socrates and Plato, they both use the expression say out them. Know yourself. Okay? And it's by asking yourself these questions that you will get a better understanding what makes the other person tick. Okay? So the what and the how are the hard skills from Aslak. Okay? The why and the who are the soft skills that they have today are much more in the society important because people have choices, people will leave the sport, uh, and we have got a role to play as a coach okay, in people's life. We impact people's life, sometimes without realizing it. I hope I've given you a few ideas, a few reflective moments uh, on what a fantastic job we have. Okay, uh, don't go and leave here and ask for holiday uh, because you don't need a holiday if you like doing your job. Okay, uh, thanks for being here these two days and uh, catch up with you. If not here, then tomorrow night in Cote.